Hello, and firstly, thank you very much for clicking on this video. Uh, my name is Glenn Alexander, and this video is entitled Wit Writ in Brass. Um, this comes in two parts. This is part one, uh, and hopefully part number two uh, should come out sometime soon in the future. Um, so before I begin, could I strongly encourage you, if you haven't already seen the first video in this series, New Shakespeare Finds, that you go and watch that first just because it will make some of the ideas in this video a little bit easier to understand. Also apologies in advance for any rambling I may do because I'm doing this uh, off the top of my head without any notes so please do bear with me. Um, now the first part of this video has been taken from a key part of uh, my book uh, called The Author which is a uh, hastily written stream of excitable consciousness which probably has loads of errors in uh, so I'm going to take one part of that today and try to better elaborate and explain it and then part two is going to extend uh, that idea into hopefully some really exciting new territory uh, so we're going to start uh, with the first folio um, which hopefully everyone's familiar with and we're going to focus again with Ben Johnson's uh, dedication uh, and we're really going to zone in uh, slightly uh, with on four lines of this. So these are the lines that we're going to focus on today. Oh, could he but have drawn his wit as well in brass as he hath hit his face? The print would then surpass all that was ever writ in brass. Well, I believe he did draw his wit in brass. Um, this is the title page of The Art of English Posy, which if you watched uh, the previous video, uh, you'll know is a really, really important uh, book um, which I'd very much encourage you to read uh, and on the front of this book you have uh, this which is uh, Richard Field's uh, printing device uh, which I believe is indeed wit writ in brass and also wit drawn in brass I think that is a brass anchor and if you think about um, printing originally you had woodcuts and then uh, copper and also brass because it lasted longer. So I believe this was indeed both drawn and uh, was drawing of brass anchor and writ uh, in brass. So it's it's, it's a brilliant uh, thing. Uh, and also the print really does surpass it. So if you watched the video last time, um, you'll know that the printer's preface is supremely important because it's very witty. There's a lot of cunning that is going on there uh, and probably is not by Richard Field at all. So I'd very much encourage you, when you read The Art of English po uh, Posy, please do not overlook the printer's preface. It is of supreme importance. Uh, also, why we should really uh, take this uh, very seriously is because Shakespeare's first ever published work, Venus and Adonis in 1593, also bears this uh, printing device of the Anne Corla Spy, Richard Field's printing device. It's uh, ever so slightly different, actually, but it is Richard Field's printing device. Uh, so we're going to have a look at this wit writ in brass today. And we're going to start by looking at the sonnet, which, if you notice, doesn't have any printing device on. How interesting. Never before imprinted. Hmm. Uh, I've underlined some things in red there. Uh, I'm sure they're not important. Feel free to either clock them or ignore them. It's up to you. Uh, so we're going to have a look at um, the references to start with, just to brass in the sonnets. Now, within the sonnets, there are four references to brass. Uh, and we're going to have a look at those now. So first off, sonnet 64. When sometime lofty towers I see down raised and brass eternal slave to mortal rage, when I have seen the hungry ocean gain advantage on the kingdom of the shore. And the firm soil win of the watery main, increasing store with loss and loss with store. Uh, so the important thing to notice there is the brass eternal, which I think is brilliant. And brass eternal, I should say. Um, and notice also uh, the ocean and the watery main, the hungry ocean uh, and the watery main references. You've got the association between brass and the ocean and water. Uh, and we can ignore the, uh, we'll ignore that. Um, so 
I love that bit because, uh, and Brass Eternal, well, what's that anchor pointing to but eight, which is also um, infinity. It's the symbol of um, eternity. So we have literally and Brass uh, Eternal, which I think is pretty witty. Uh, if we have a look at Sonnet 65, since brass nor stone nor earth nor boundless sea, but sad mortality or sways their power. Well, we have since brass and again our sea reference, uh, linking those two ideas, brass and sea. Oh, oh that's interesting. Quite a, oh. uh, we'll, we'll just ignore that for the time being. Um, and also... Just note the rack fall, if you watched the video last time, uh, in particular with the Westminster Monument, with the rack and also the Tempest, that reference leave not a rack behind, rack fall uh, ca causing shipwreck. Um, just going to alert you to that and say absolutely no more about it. Um, and also you have other references uh, to uh, this anchor, uh, or what strong hand can hold this swift foot back? Well, if we think about what an anchor is doing, uh, holding something swift uh, back, you'll find lots of references, actually, um, to uh, a, a potential anchor. We'll ignore that. Uh, Sonnet 107. And thou in this shalt, shalt find thy monument when tyrants, crests and tombs of brass are spent. Uh, well, if we have a look... We have a crest, a device, an emblem of a family uh, or a person. Uh, so we have a crest here and we have some brass that's being spent or used on the front of it. So we have literally some brass in a crest. Um, and if, if we have a look at this one, our fourth and final brass reference in the sonnets in Sonnet 120. Needs must I under my transgression bow, unless my nerves were brass or hammered steel. Well, I think his nerves were uh, brass. I think he was pretty bold, to say the least. Um, and uh, what I love here is this word bow, because if you think about a play on words here, bow of a ship, under my transgression bow, just like the anchor. Again, that association also there, uh, which I think is, again, really... Uh, uh, quite brilliant. Oh, sorrow, interesting. Um, and if we look at this, my deepest sense, how hard true sorrow hits. Well, if we remember the Ben Johnson dedication, as well in brass as he hath hit, well, there is our hit. Um, so, uh, there's also one reference in the sonnets to an anchor. And if we have a look at this, uh, here, if eyes corrupt by over partial looks be anchored in the bay where all men ride, I love that as well. I think that's really great. Why of eyes falsehood hast thou forged hooks whereto the judgment of my heart is tied? Well, there's your anchor, but look at what is surrounding that anchor. I think that's bay or laurels, and bay is another word for laurels. Um, so I think that's an anchor wrapped in the bay. You also notice that the uh, the bay seems to be in the shape of an ichthus, a symbol of the fish, um, which I I think is uh, cool. Um, and yeah, if we have a look at this as well, or mine eyes seeing this, say this is not to put fair truth upon so foul a face. Well, if we think again about the Ben Johnson, as well in brass as he hath hit his face, the print would then surpass. Well, there's your face and your face. Uh, just notice this say. Notice there's no space uh, in between there. Uh, so I'm like, oh, that's a printing error. Um, well, I, I disagree with that. I think that's actually really important because um, I think it's telling you something. And in this case, I think it's actually telling you IHS, the first three letters of Jesus uh, from the uh, from the monogram uh, and stay, which is what an anchor does effectively. Um, and if we have a look back to the dedication, you'll notice O could and his face both don't have spaces in. That is not a mistake. That is telling you that something is going on. Uh, so if we have a look. And let's have a look at his face. Well, 
you might be able to see this before I show you, around the face of this device, we have an I, H and an S. Clever, no? Uh, that H, half of it is in darkness, but an I and a H if you uh, rotate it, the same thing. Um, so his face, you have an IHS around uh, the face of this device, which is really brilliant. Uh, o could, again, there's no space between there. Uh, the comma is a pause or a rest, uh, much like the function of an anchor. Well, you have an O, and I think uh, that could is actually an anagram of cloud. So indeed, you have a comma, a rest, um, coming out uh, of this cloud in this O. I think that's really brilliant. Uh, to be honest, I think that's, I think that's incredible. Um, so, Okud and his face we've explored. And I should say, throughout the sonnets, there are references uh, to some of the uh, key things, uh, such as the anchor, um, kind of woven through. They're like thematic threads that have been woven through the sonnets. So, for instance, Sonnet 85, My tongue-tied muse in manners holds her still. If you think about uh, that in the context of an anchor. In polished form of well-refined pen, could be written in brass, for instance, and to the most of praise add something more, uh, though words come hindmost, holds his rank before. Uh, that idea, uh, you'll notice the punctuation that's always important when something's going on there. Uh, hindmost holds his rank before. How interesting. And I'll also say this sonnet uh, 77, the vacant leaves thy mind's imprint will bear, much like a printer's imprint. And of this book, this learning, mayst thou taste. Well, there's a lot of brilliant learning uh, to be had in the art of English uh, posy. And here is our printer's imprint, which we're looking at. Uh, just to remind you, the art of English posy was originally printed uh, without the name of any author, as our printer will tell you. That's really important. It was without any author's name. Um, that's incredibly important. And we also, um, by paying attention to the printer's preface and actually what he's teaching you, he gives you directions to understand what's going on within the art of English poetry. Sometimes he directly tells you, uh, I'm doing this, uh, and teaches you the figures of which he is modelling and using on you. Well, they all... Uh, culminate in somewhat of a climactic node of all of these important devices um, and where he reveals his identity in the figure of response, the figure of answering a question which he poses in the previous chapter. Uh, this is from uh, book three, uh, chapter 19. The question he asks is, who is the author? Well, he reveals this in the figure of response and we found it to be Edward uh, de Vere. I'd like to remind any um, uh, Stratfordians uh, watching. I was actually not an Oxfordian when I found this book. Um, I wasn't actually remotely interested in the authorship question. Uh, I found this book and found this. Then I became increasingly interested in the authorship uh, question and now believe from this uh, it is Edward de Vere. Um, so if we have a look, that's important. I need to tell you it was Edward de Vere because of what else is on this uh, Device. Now, if we have a look at some variations of this uh, anchor cross, you'll see the cross and the base of the anchor. And you can very clearly see we have a cross and a V-shaped anchor. You could argue those hooks are also Vs. Um, why V? Well, de Vere V was an important uh, letter for him. But also, if you notice this, which is nuts, what's the anchor pointing to? It's pointing to a V in negative space. So you literally have a V underneath this anchor. Why is that important? Well, to put fair truth upon so foul a face. Well, I love this line because that V is equidistant between the first and last characters. You've got 15 characters before, 15 after. V is directly in the centre, just as that V is directly in the centre beneath that anchor. You are putting that V upon the face of this device, which is really amazing. And just to remind you, uh, Edward de Beer's uh, motto, Vero uh, Nilo uh, nil, Nihil uh, Various, uh, nothing truer than true. That uh, Vero and Various, Verity, it means truth, which is why this V is important. So the V is 
is important for this truth. He is literally putting this truth on this space. And also, if you have a look at Sonnet 137 again, uh, in things right true, my heart and eyes have erred, and to this false plague are they now transferred. I love that word transferred, because if you think about what a printer is doing, he's transferring ink from the printing uh, mould onto the page. Um, so I, I really like that. Um, so let's talk about uh, what Ancora Spy actually means. Well, Ancora, obviously, anchor, and uh, spy means hope. So it's the anchor of hope. Uh, but if you notice the way it's written around this device, there's actually a space between an, cola, spy, with the anchor coming out between uh, ko and ra. Um, ra could also be the sun god, and that is a... Uh, uh, that is a uh, nice cerebral looking cloud there. Uh, so let's just have a look at each one of these. So that space is really, really important. So let's have a look at an. What does an mean? Well, for the Latin scholars among you, you may know that an means or. So the translation of Latin uh, of an in Latin means or. Uh, and you've been seeing quite a few of those ors already. Uh, there's actually even more meaning behind that or which we'll look at, but it's really, really important. Um, also, cola, which is brilliant, so brilliant. Cola, according to the Oxford Latin Dictionary 1982, uh, means a site for a monument. So you have a site for a monument, and what is coming out from this site of a monument but the monument of this anchor? anchor. Um, and ben Johnson will tell you in the second a dedicated poem to the, to the first folio, thou art a monument. So this is his monument, uh, and, and this is a perfect device for doing it. And spy uh, means hope, which, uh, yeah, we know. Uh, so if we have a look and call our spy, um, I think this is just so clever and so, so witty. Um, since spite of him, I'll live in this poor rhyme while he insults all dull and speechless tribes. And thou in this shalt find thy monument when tyrants' crests and tombs of brass are spent. I love this poor rhyme, partly because it contains... Well, actually, this is brilliant the more I look at it, because you have uh, the O-R. And if I remind you... Uh, <laughs> what the greek symbol for r is it's the it's the row it's the it's the p so you actually have or and or you have two ors there that is utterly brilliant okay and while he insults or dull and speechless tribes like this is in the sonnets look with your eyes it is there okay um and this is really important this is the poor rhyme and caller you have or and or in an caller. That's just absolute genius. Um, also, if you have a look at this T uh, at the end, it's ever so slightly uh, different from all the others. Uh, just for fun, I'm not sure whether this is true or not, but I think it's brilliant if it is. If you take a T uh, and then take another T and put it back, what do you have but the shape uh, of an anchor, um, which I think is great. Uh, so if we have a look at my favourite or sonnet, this is one, two, five. Um, you might notice the double V, the Devere there. Uh, <laughs> just watch what happens. It's brilliant. So that's at the bottom of the page, that or there. Um, you have an or on every single line apart from two. Uh, there's only two lines that don't have or on. And on those two lines, what you have but art and art. And also uh, two double Vs, de Vere. So you have the two double Vs and the art on both of those lines. But this is just genius. Um, and you've got ors at the bottom of both pages. Uh, it's like this because it continues on to another page. Um, uh, I, I also hate the H, if you remember, is the eater, uh, which is a, a type of E. And our Devere, and also you have this at the bottom, our Eta E. If you haven't watched the previous video, I, I might explain it a little bit later as well. Uh, and Epsilon, which is another E, which is great. So you've got two E's there. E's a very important thing, which we'll talk about. Now, uh, I really love referring back uh, to the monuments at both uh, Stratford, which is this one, um, 
and also the Westminster because he's embedded a lot of these devices into the monuments themselves, which is really brilliant. So if you try to find uh, your or uh, in this, well, you're going to see it. it's one of the most compact letters there, far more. You have your or there. Uh, you also have an or uh, in right next to the art in Maranem, you have another or there, um, right next to art. It's, it's great. Uh, but there's actually some uh, other really brilliant things going on here. If we just look at the left hand side uh, in particular, and we start with the first one, uh, Judico uh, Pilium, uh, Nestor for Judgment. Well, think about it Nestor, Nestor. It has an or on the end, and we have our or beneath it. Brilliant. Uh, Terra uh, Tegit, uh, covered with the earth. Well, I suppose an anchor that's been dropped would, would be covered with the earth. Um, stay passenger. Well, staying, again, that's the function of an anchor. Uh, we have our an in Kanst, um, which is the only an that I can see in that. Uh, with this monument, where we've talked about the Kola, uh, the monument, uh, which is the anchor itself, which is really brilliant. Quick nature died, whose name doth deck the sea tomb. <laughs> Decking the sea tomb. <laughs> Again, that monument and tomb from the what we've looked at previously. And lastly, leaves living art. It's all there. It's really, really amazing. Um, I, I just think it's absolutely brilliant. And we also have another Anne uh, there. So where does the anchor of hope come from? Now, that's a really interesting question. When we ask that question, um, well, I believe it is, quite frankly, the ultimate peak behind the curtain. Now, this is taken um, from Henry Peachams. Henry Peachams. Henry Peachams. Henry Peachams. Uh, Minerva Britannia. Uh, I really like it. I think it's the peak behind the curtain because look at one of the last two letters that... Uh, disappearing hand has written it's or he's written or if it, like this is this is in, this is incredible okay um if we have a look at what it means this is the title page of the minerva britannia um you, you might be able to see some really interesting things already uh, but uh, mente uh, vidabor uh, means by the mind i shall be seen or discovered and you certainly will be discovered uh, with this very witty uh, or uh, and on the surrounding scroll, uh, Vivita Ingenio uh, Ketela Mortis, uh, genius lives on, all else is mortal. Well, I think this is genius uh, and you deserve to live on because you are just brilliant in so many ways, particularly in part two, like we need a public holiday for this guy. Uh, anyway, so if we actually have a look at what's going on and this is nuts, get ready, OK? Uh, so an, an, or, 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 or. Or you've got quite a few ors, but also notice this devices furnished, emblems, impressors, published and print down at the bottom, uh, all kind of uh, referencing these printers devices. This book, actually, if you read it, which is incredibly witty, and I'll show you some cool things uh, probably in the next video. Uh, it's all to do with printers' devices, effectively, those those illustrations uh, in uh, books. And it's it, it's very clever and very witty uh, and I, I really like it as well uh, but that's really interesting now as I was saying this is the I was kind of taking a bit of a tangent sorry uh, but this is I think the definitive peak behind the curtain um, oh yeah how did I how did I forget to tell you that look mister of the arts yeah it, it, it's all here for you if we pay attention uh, now Freud uh, was a De uh, an Oxfordian he believed De Vere, uh, was uh, behind Shakespeare um, and I, I think he would have really appreciated this peak behind the curtain that we're going to have a look. Now, to do that, um, before we have a look at that, uh, and I don't wish to tarnish the metal, so to speak, of this man, because um, I, I think he's he's brilliant, but I think there's an important thing we need to know before I show you this, which was something he did when he was 17. Uh, when he was 17 uh, at uh, uh, William Cecil Knight's, uh, Lord Burley, um, in his house, he was uh, he was duelling in the courtyard, uh, and he managed to kill when he was seventeen uh, the undercook. Uh, so he killed the undercook when he was seventeen. Now the death penalty 
uh, was was in play for committing murder, which he did when he was 17. Um, and he, he should have faced the death penalty, but the most powerful uh, man in England at the time, uh, who he, he was a ward of, effectively, uh, living in his house, uh, uh, Lord Burley, uh, kind of got him off. Um, and how they got him off was saying uh, that the the undercook was drunk and he ran on to his sword and thereby committed suicide. And it's it's quite a harrowing story. Like his, his, I think his wife had a miscarriage and like it, it's horrible. Um, but he got let off uh, for murder um, through some clever uh, legal um, defence. Um, and this was in his formative early years. Now, this is really important because De Vere uh, was deeply religious, really, really deeply religious. And he's committed murder uh, when he's 17, arguably one of the worst uh, sins. Now, that's really important for where the Angkor spy comes from, which I'm about to show you. And it comes from um, Hebrews 6. So I'm going to read this and I'm going to read it in its entirety because I think it's so important to understand the psychology of, of this man. Uh, Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that led to death and of faith in God. Instruction about cleansing rites, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And God permitting, we will do so. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. To their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. Land that drinks in the rain often falling on it and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is farmed receives the blessing of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles and worthless uh, is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. Even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are convinced of better things in your case. The things that have to do with salvation. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. We want each of you to show this same diligence to the very end so that what you hope for may be fully realised. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit, inherit what has been promised, the certainty of God's promise. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater after uh, for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. <laughs> and so uh, after waiting patiently, Abraham uh, received what was promised. People swear by someone greater than themselves and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, he who have have, uh, fled to take hold of the hope set before them may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. Where our forerunner Jesus has entered on our behalf, he became a high priest forever in the order of uh, Melchizedek. If I'm saying that correctly. Uh, So this is why it's so important. It is this uh, verse here, Hebrews 6.19. De Vere must have been suffering from the guilt of his early formative years of committing murder and being as religious as he was very much wanted this redemption by doing great works uh, to help other people and he surely has uh, done this but this is where the Angkor spy comes from it is this promise uh, of that God has made this hope as an anchor for the soul uh, and just as we saw in this uh, picture uh, beforehand it enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain, which is why I think uh, that title illustration is so important. Now, I love this. Um, I was like, uh, I asked my dad, uh, who is a Baptist minister. Uh, I'm not religious, but my dad is uh, very so much so as one would expect. And I was like, Dad, w- where does this come from? Um, 
And he was like, well, Glenn, um, there's actually a lot of debate over who uh, wrote it. Um, so there's, which I, I find wonderfully ironic that it is an unknown author uh, who has written this. I just think that's very funny. Um, anyway, so uh, that hopefully explains um, uh, where the un- Ancora Spy is coming from. Just note also the verse and hopefully you might get a little excited when you realise uh, that the sonnets, that's the date of publication of the sonnets, which doesn't bear uh, the imprint of a printer on the front, uh, it's there, uh, let me say. So this is the the peek behind the curtain into the inner sanctuary, which I think is just remarkable. Um, so uh, we talked about where the Ancora spy comes from. Now, what we're going to do uh, quickly is have a look within the art of English poesy itself, uh, because there's more wit to be found around this idea of the Ancora spy. Uh, so if we have a look in book one, chapter 30, I think, uh, of short et- epigrams called posies. Well, the Ancora spy is in itself an epigram. Uh, there be also other like epigrams that were sent usually for New Year's gifts or to be printed or just notice how that to be printed is between two ors. These things are being done very deliberately, put upon their blanketing dishes or sugar plates, both of which are round, uh, or of which I haven't highlighted, March pains and such other dainty meats as by the courtesy and custom every jest might carry from a common uh, feast home with him to his own house. Um, I, I believe it is leading back to his own house. And were made for the nonce, they were called uh, nenia, which I think is actually very clever. And I adore this word with a passion, or apophoreta. Uh, remember I did say that the P is also the Greek row, so you have uh, or uh, and an or there. Uh, you have the or here. And look, H which is eater and eater on the end. But that's just the most perfect word uh, t- to describe what's actually going on, as you'll see uh, in a little bit. Uh, and never contained above one verse or two at the most, but the shorter, the better. Uh, there's an or in there, actually, isn't there? Uh, we call them posies and we do paint them now a days upon the backsides of our fruit trenches of wood. Uh, or use them as devices in rings and arms about such courtly purposes. Well, there's our ring and arm um, that's being used for courtly purposes. Well, he's, he's written the art of English prosy to turn the, uh, uh, the the rude rhymer into a courtly poet. Um, uh, but also look at this, the trenches of wood. On the backsides of trenches of wood. Think about what the printer's using to print. He's using, like, early on, blocks of wood. Um, which is brilliant. I also love this. Um, Spy, hope, inside the O, is actually an anagram of posy, which is brilliant, um, which is why posy's probably there. So there's so much brilliance going in uh, to what he's writing in this. It's it's so witty once you know uh, what you're looking for. And I adore, in particular, this clever device here. Um, Just think about how you'd say this. I would read that as Anka. That's Anka, Anka, uh, which is brilliant. Okay, um, and he he will explain this, so it kind of does make sense if you are, are reading for the meaning. Um, so this is in the parenthesis or the inserter. I'm going to skip uh, the first bit. Also in our eclogue entitled Elpine, uh, which we made being but 18 years old to King Edward. The sixth, a prince of great hope, we surmised that the pilot of a ship answering the king, being inquisitive and desirous to know all the parts, desire again there actually for those of you who watched the previous video, uh, know all the parts of the ship and tackle, i.e. equipment of the ship, uh, what they were and to what use they served, uh, using the insertion or parenthesis. Uh, here's a parenthesis, it's just a bit of external information really to divert your attention to what's actually going on and so proceeds to answer the king's question the ship thou seest sailing in the sea so large and continue um that's a well that's a that's your anchor so it's answering the question he's answering this question uh because he hasn't answered it there he answers it with the anchor because he's asked he wanted to know about the ship's tackle and there is your device, the anchor. So it's just showing you that the anchor is really this device. And you can also see it in some other places, which is great. The heaping figure I'd recommend because he's heaping device on uh, and device and device and device, showing you what he's doing. 
uh, the figure of repetition again I did tell you uh, and thus by Master Edward uh, Dyer uh, vehement swift and passionately but if my faith my hope my love and my true intent my liberty my service vowed my time and all be spent in vain anchor um, so it's there as well hope and anchor um, if we have a look at uh, it continues blah blah blah, blah so this is the same thing it's still continuing uh, but thou art free uh, but were thou not indeed uh, but were thou not come of immortal uh, seed uh, never born and thy mind made to bless remember that cloud is kind of in the shape uh, of it's, it's kind of a creation of adam-esque um heaven's metal that everlasting well that is heaven's metal coming out of some mind shape uh, clouds and pointing to an eight uh, were not thy wit and that thy virtue shall by deemed uh, divine thy favour face got the face again and thy lose uh, any name may never die nor thy state turn stayed by destiny but well, what's the anchor, need, anchor doing but staying uh, you could argue it's in the O which turns uh, likewise you've got um, dread where last once thy noble heart may feel some rueful turn of her unsteady uh, wheel so we've we've got all of this uh, here it's literally telling you what's what's going on it's great i love these ones uh, apostrophe wonderful words remember that greek rose so you've got or and or uh, h and e on the end as well um, who was transformed to bows of bay well there's our bows of bay again uh, from her cursed heart and continue uh, likewise a cheer where love and majesties do reign both mild and stern if you remember the bow uh, here we have the stern anchor and continue anchor it's, it's great uh, i really uh, like this one as well this is aporia or the doubtful why might it be doubtful uh, where, where if we look at the last line moved her there too well you're not going to be moved if you're using an anchor so it's all there it's, it's why it's doubtful it's, it's witty um this is cool as well the uh, pro again uh, zugma or the ringleader well we have a ring there um and you have plenty of oars um and anchor there um sometimes also remember this is uh for the ear as well as the nonce uh so servitor uh, servitor and discourse uh, it has contains the or sound within it um where you see this one word pursed pursed means perished that idea of nothing which is really important placed in the forward got that or but you also have the forward as in the printer's preface satisfy both in sense and congruity all those other clauses that follow him cool uh, i really enjoy this sonnet in particular if you have a look at all the oars that are going on or i shall live your epitaph to make look at all the oars um, that are taking place is really uh, brilliant your monument shall be my gentle verse which eyes not yet cre created shall or read and tongues to be your being shall rehearse um yeah it's it's your monument or i think i'm ho ho i'm really praying that you can see this um it, it's there i'm hoping you can see this with your own eyes um which is the important thing again sonnet 82 or look um and I love this fresher stamp, again, the stamp of the printer. And my probably my second favourite or words, if not my favourite words, is this rhetoric, which has both your or and your heth in. Now, that's brilliant uh, for the genius that I hope uh, will always live on if if you know also um, why or. Um, <laughs> this is just brilliant. I applauded. Uh, I, I physically had to applaud uh, when I realised this, because this was just remarkable uh, genius, um, which deserves to live on. Well, what is your or? Well, if you translate your or uh, in Greek, you have eater with an accent. Uh, your tavos, uh, your tonos. Um, and your, your eater with your accent. Uh, well, we've looked at our eater before. Our eater uh, is a form of e uh, we've seen this and this is your heth which we discussed in your in the last video this really important um heth is uh, 
uh, gives you your eta, but you're looking at this same e. So all of those or references, uh, just like uh, the additional e on the end, uh, is this e. This is your device of conceit. I love the word uh, conceit. I think conceit is the perfect term for what the e is because uh, it not only means uh, pride in oneself, but also a device of um, like an, an, an ingenious metaphor. Uh, so this is exactly what the E is. And why is E so important? Well, have a look. It's the most characteristic letter in his name, Edward de Vere. It's also the first letter and the last letter. Um, it, it's brilliant. So it appears four times, first and last, and is most characteristic. Characteristic. It is uh, his device of ingenuity, but also of his self. It is, it is a device of conceit. And your or is also uh, uh, this e. Uh, e from Greek is translated, uh, so e with the accent is translated, is this or, which is just amazing. It's the device of conceit again. It's just incredible. Um, so we looked uh, last time. Uh, he teaches the first figure in the arts is the is this e of surplus, where he's added the e on the end. So he's taught us the first figure. Um, we'll look at the last figure in the next video. Um, but if we have a look at uh, what I showed you last time, his arms are in an E, he's pointing to an E. Uh, that's not right because in, in the original uh, first folios, there's an E in towers. You'll notice all those additional E's. It is this figure, um, uh, this, this device of conceit. Um, and what's really lovely is also if we have a look at the Westminster uh, monument and we have a look for those ors. Well, let's have a look at what's going on. And that means or if we remember that our P is also our row or 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 you've got five ors there, um, which is just like amazing. Um, so it's not just in this other people have known about uh, this throughout history. I'm going to start calling this Shakespeare gate because uh, it seems so many uh, poets, um, academics, uh, have known this. I suppose they didn't want to give the game away, but I feel probably now is t time. The time is right. Um, uh, I'm not superstitious, but it is the year of the ox. Um, so it's poetic. If if we have a look at this wonderful, uh, brilliantly witty author here, William Lowes Rushton, he trained at Gray's Inn. So did uh, De Vere, uh, who does many witty things within this wonderful book. Um, if we just have a look at some of them, if we have a look at uh, the title page, you're going to find an or on every line. Apart from the one that doesn't have ors on, uh, you have e's in every word. Why? Because or, remember, means our e. And on the last line, uh, he does like to spell it out. You have your am, which is your or, your archer, which is close to anchor, I suppose, um, and your uh, anchor uh, to end it on. Uh, which is absolutely fantastic. So like William Lowe's Rushton is just so incredibly witty and deserves to live forever just for his sheer wit in, in this book, which I, I very much enjoy. Uh, and if we have a look at the sonnets, cryptic dedication uh, and that eternity, your an uh, there and your eternity and your or is the last word in setting forth. It contains that or in the last uh, word, uh, which I think is uh, really great as well so i'm pretty exhausted now so i'm gonna i'm gonna stop this um uh, and let you know about part two so in part two uh, we're gonna look at when where and who has used this device uh, and i hope this video will be uh, i hope quite groundbreaking if i'm not condemned as a heretic or a lunatic um i hope this video is really um useful to a lot of people out there um so i'm going to wrap up by uh, just plugging this wonderful book if you want to know more about uh, edward de vere uh, who i believe is the author of the art of english poesy and the person behind uh, the creation of shakespeare um is uh, this wonderful book shakespeare by another name by mark anderson wonderful uh, biographical details there um uh, just remind you there's some wonderful uh, institutions out there who are really taking forward um, bearing the flag of Edward de Vere and have been for some time. The de Vere Society, uh, which I really, really like. Uh, I'm a member of the Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship, which 
you never know in future I may be as well and the Shakespeare Authorship Trust of which I'm also uh, now a member uh, are all brilliant uh, institutions which I very much encourage you uh, to join uh, this is a wonderful human being uh, who's got a wonderful uh, YouTube channel as well which I'd encourage you to go and check out all of the brilliant things he's doing and go subscribe over there because he's just building up such a bank and wealth of evidence that eventually the tides will turn um so go check out his wonderful youtube channel um i certainly enjoy it um and also if you have any doubts uh, about uh, the authorship of shakespeare yet which if you read the art um and actually read it um i'd, I'd imagine that a fair few people might um then please do go and sign the doubt about uh, will um coalition uh, we have um I think there's like 5,000 signatures. Um, so come and join in expressing that doubt. Uh, and just going to plug my very poorly written but excitable uh, book, which has a lot more discoveries, which I'm, I'm not even going to try making videos as about just yet. Uh, that can wait because I'm going to need a rest in a bit. Um, and yeah, so I shall hopefully see you in part two um, of what I hope is quite a groundbreaking uh, video. Uh, thank you very much for watching. I'm exhausted. I really need a glass of water. So I'm going to go now. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much for watching. Take care. Bye-bye.